A few years back, I bought a pair of really nice shoes for a holiday party, like really nice shoes. Strappy black heels that made my legs look long and lean. I loved them. I even liked the box. I brought the shoes home and took them up to my closet. I took the box out and admired it. Took the shoes out and put them on. Admired them in the mirror. But within a couple of minutes walking around in those strappy heels in my bedroom, hardwired Lutheran guilt swept over me like a massive wave. <laughs> Though I could technically afford them, the shoes were unnecessary and way too expensive. I wouldn't be able to wear them with a clear conscience. <laughs> the wave was too powerful. The shoes would have to be returned. So back into the box they went. Then I went downstairs to my husband's office, told him I'd been shopping, and reached for his hand. Without another word, he followed me upstairs and took me to bed. He understood it's a thing with me, this pattern, spending money, hardwired guilt, sex. <laughs> For most people, Thanksgiving's horn of plenty symbolizes both excessive consumption of food and the start of the season of consumption of a different sort, Black Friday. Small Business Saturday, Cyber Monday, and the weeks that follow mean excessive spending of money. For me, this represents a different sort of horn. <laughs> Interestingly enough, this pattern of behavior only happens when I spend the money. And I am responsible for buying the vast majority of the presents that go under our tree. <laughs> Suffice to say, my husband likes the lead up to Christmas. <laughs> As a child, I looked forward to Christmas for weeks. My father was a Lutheran minister and my mother a Lutheran teacher. So as a good Lutheran family, we celebrated the month-long Advent season with bi-weekly church services, an Advent calendar, an Advent wreath with candles, and nightly devotions that always, always ended with a lesson, the so-called moral of the story, or as I now understand it, a bow of forgiveness, empathy, or goodwill. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had more than our fair share of goodwill. I didn't look forward to Christmas because I expected to receive a shit ton of gifts. We received only a couple of presents. Once we no longer believed in Santa, which for me happened when I was five, thanks to older siblings, on Christmas morning we received only a stocking filled with small stuff, candy, socks, and orange. The real presents came on Christmas Eve, a gift or two from our parents, pajamas from our grandparents, and a gift from our secret Santa, the sibling who had selected our name in the family draw, which was nearly as much of a celebration as Christmas itself. Even as a young kid, I realized that because the presents were few, it was the preparation that made Christmas Christmas. It was the stringing of popcorn and cranberries, the caroling, the creating and daily tearing of green and red paper chains, and the big Christmas shopping day downtown. Mid-December, my parents took us to Marshall Fields in downtown Chicago to tour the holiday windows, shop for our secret Santa gifts, and eat lunch under the big Christmas tree. In the afternoon, we went to see the Christmas Carol to watch the spirits of Christmas, past, present, and future remind us what it's all about. The truth is, I don't remember many of my Christmas presents. That is, until the year I was 13, when I received a down coat from my parents, a coat my father had chosen himself, 
and when he learned the mannequin was wearing the last one, he asked the clerk to remove it so he could buy it for me. Purple and blue. It was bright, it was puffy, and it was mine. <laughs> Truly mine, only mine. No one had ever worn it before. And as the third girl in a family strapped for cash, I rarely wore clothes that hadn't belonged to someone else before. Which isn't to say I never had clothes that were only mine as a kid. My mom was a talented seamstress and she made us all matching holiday outfits. Lemon yellow dresses with white trim for Easter. Red or green velvet for Christmas. Psychedelic jumpsuits for vacations with their grandparents. But when it came to store-bought clothes and coats in particular, I always wore a hand-me-down. That is, until that puffy purple and blue down coat. Strange as it may seem, I still remember putting it on, feeling it wrap around me. The fabric had a crispness to it. A new coat smell, if such a thing exists. I remember walking over to the mirror that covered the wall above the dining room buffet, staring at myself and feeling something akin to pleasure. That feeling of wearing something new that you know looks good. And I was hooked. <laughs> Entering high school like my siblings, I was allotted a total of $100 a year for clothes, shoes, and coats. I understand now this was a stretch for my parents, but as a teenager, all I knew was this was not enough. The solution was earning my own money, so I found work. I babysat. I cleaned old people's houses. I babysat more, and I budgeted for clothes, jeans, ugly striped shirts, and truly awful vests. sweaters with lace collars. My sister, Trisha, a year ahead of me in school, was obsessed with clothes. She kept a calendar of what she wore, making sure not to repeat an item within eight days. She allowed me to borrow things every now and then, but there were rules. If complimented, I needed to confess to the ownership of the item. <laughs> And I was not allowed to borrow anything that messed with her schedule. What to wear became a stressor every damn day. At the same time, the feeling of wearing something new became something I wanted to replicate as often as possible. So I kept babysitting and cleaning houses for senior citizens. As soon as I could, I started waitressing so I could save for college, sure, but also so I could buy clothes and shoes. Under our mom's tutelage, my sisters and I became expert hanger snapper shoppers at TJ Maxx and Marshalls. We'd push the whole rack of clothes off to the right and then whip them one hanger at a time to the left, identifying a reasonable choice in seconds. We learned to swipe long before dating apps. No, no, yes, no, no, maybe, no, no. I'd watched my mom date payment envelopes before putting them in the antique mail sorter that hung by our front door, knowing checks would bounce if they cashed too soon. I'd grown up appreciating the ability to stretch a pound of ground beef to feed a family of eight, how to turn eggs and leftover potatoes into dinner. Budgeting was both a science and an art. Buying cheap was key, spending too much was wrong, shameful. I didn't realize at the time how this would affect me, but it has, and it hasn't gone away. Spending money brings me pleasure. New clothes and shoes bring me pleasure, but they also bring me guilt and shame, feeling like I've eaten of the forbidden fruit, like Eve with Adam in that garden filled with songs of birds and buzzing of bees, which brings me to the sex part. <laughs> Something else from my childhood that carries with it both shame and pleasure. No, that's not accurate. It carries the promise of pleasure, 
pleasure one must wait for because as a good Lutheran girl, I was raised to believe God was watching kind of like Santa all the time. <laughs> And when you had sex, he knew. And as my mother put it, you were married in God's eyes. I knew the Bible, both Old Testament and New, had rules about this. This didn't mean you couldn't enjoy sex. You could. But this is key only if you were married. My parents weren't prudish, mind you. Along with National Geographic and the Chicago Tribune, my dad had a subscription to Playboy. And my mom received lingerie every year from Christmas in her stocking, along with a rutabaga. <laughs> which I never quite understood. <laughs> Sex wasn't bad it was just restricted to one person, that one person you'd married in God's eyes. Again, technically, I did not break the biblical rules, but I did get married to my husband in God's eyes long before I got married to him in a church. <laughs> and the day I bought my wedding dress, which cost a pretty penny, my husband and I got married <laughs> multiple times in quick succession. <laughs> Here's the thing. I know the spending money guilt sex pattern makes sense from a deep psychologically fucked up perspective. <laughs> but I've now been married for 34 years. I'm no longer poor. Last month, I began my 60th trip around the sun. Yes. <laughs> and like many women before me, I realized the time had come and gone to live by the rules and standards of others. It was time to live life on my own terms, and it was definitely time to leave guilt-ridden sex to Christmas's past. This year, Christmas present, in the spirit of bringing joy to others. I bought an expensive pair of high black strappy shoes, otherwise known as fuck me shoes. And when I got home, I put them on, admired them briefly in the mirror, and went downstairs to my husband's office without any guilt at all. As for Christmas's future, I'm keeping those shoes. Anastasia, ladies and gentlemen, Anastasia.